You are listening to the Digital Parent Podcast with your host, Seth Lewis. All right, everyone. Today, we want to welcome Dr. Desmond Patton of the University of Michigan School of Social Work to the Digital Parent Podcast today. Dr. Patton is the current director of the SAFE Lab and doing some of the most groundbreaking research that you will find on teens and internet and violence and social media. And I think he's coined the term internet banking. So Dr. Patton, welcome to our show today. Thank you so much for having me. And just one correction, I've moved to Columbia University in New York City. Well, that's the University of Michigan's laws. (laughs) Thank you. So uh, one of the questions we have is right now, since you moved to Columbia, what type of research are you doing currently when it comes to youth violence and social media, especially like Twitter and Instagram? Yeah, absolutely. I actually just finished a manuscript that looks at the ways in which youth conceptualize threats on social media platforms like Twitter and Instagram. And so in the academic year of 2014 and 2015, I interviewed um, about 40 uh, youth in Chicago, um, half of whom were gang involved from neighborhoods all over Chicago. And I wanted to know in particular, how does street life in the way in which they maneuver um, their neighborhoods, end up on social media. And within that, I, I was particularly interested in, well, how do they know when a violent event is happening online? Because, you know, it's all about interpretation. And so the youth were very clear about what threats were for them. And in particular, some of the things that I found was threats had to be direct. So there had to be another person. Their name could be tagged in a post, their street address or their identifying information needed to be a part of the post so they could be clear that there was somebody, some person that was, or or a group of people, another gang perhaps, that the threat was being directed towards. Um, another thing that was really important was you had to be known or kind of thought of as being a tough person for the threat to be thought of as credible. So a lot of you said, well, if I, if, if I know that you're a part of a gang or if I know that you, you know, are associated with a certain group of people, then I'm more likely to take that threat as real versus you being someone else or, you know, you pretending to be tough or, or what people may call an internet gangster. So those are some of the um, important findings that I've been discussing in my in my work as of lately. So those were actual real gang involved youth, what we call those deep end kids that you're doing the research with. So for those youth, I guess what we're hearing is you have to have a direct uh, threat. In other words, you have to have uh, mentioned on Twitter or calling that person's Twitter handle out or their Instagram for them to actually take it serious. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Wow, that's interesting research. Thank you. Now, one of the things I know you talk about in your research is this difference and this collision between the virtual space and the physical space now with um, young people. So basically where, you know, in the past, you could just make these threats on Twitter and, and Instagram and other social media and nothing would happen. But now what we're saying is when these threats are being made, people are actually showing up to your doorstep and calling you out the house and either, you know, engaging in fights or, or, or worse. Uh, you know, I think you see those uh, types of videos on sites such is Warsaw hip hop, you know, all the time. Yes. And, you know, have you started seeing like a lot of those collisions where things are happening on the internet and all of a sudden you're seeing it actually play out in real life? Yeah, I think what you're highlighting is is the distinction that I think is between cyberbullying and internet banging. I think that with cyberbullying, which is, I think, a phenomenon that's probably more situated in more affluent communities or among white youth, um, in which you see people kind of making threats, talking about each other, and things more so staying online or going into the school setting, but not really becoming this big fight or an injury or a possible death. But what I'm seeing in the world that I'm doing is in urban neighborhoods where violence is pervasive and there is a code of the street. There's a way in which youth and young adults in these communities interact with one another. And, and, and one of those things is that it's important to kind of to present as tough, to protect yourself, to surround yourself with people that you think are safe. 
all those things matter and all those things end up on social media. And so the same types of behaviors that you see in the community are the same types of behaviors that you see online as well. And so it, it is common for someone to make a threat and that threat to be passed through the social networks, right? You are now part of a network public where your host can hit unintended parties, right? And so once that happens and you find out, you still have to defend yourself. Your honor still has to be defended. And so that's why I believe we are seeing some of the same types of behaviors replicate themselves online. You know, that's a great point. And I think one of the things you you also see, I think you're alluding to this, is sometimes what you'll see with young people, um, especially on, I think, Facebook, you have a lot of young people that will actually, you know, show weapons, uh, brand weapons, like actually on social media in order to portray this, you know, sense of masculinity and this sense of toughness. Yeah. Um, Are you saying that as, are they really true gangsters or is this a situation where they need to show that, that toughness in order to protect themselves in real life? That's a tough question because I think that it depends. I think that there are some people that are um, in gangs. And it's interesting because I've also talked to some former gang members, uh, you know, uh, a group of folks that are probably around my age in their 30s and early 40s. And they have noted a difference in how younger gang members are interacting in space now because they were born digital. Right. So it's a different world, a different space. And so I think gang cultures, gang factions have had a shift in how they deal with, you know, the culture of silence. And so it very much depends because I think that there are a group of people who may live in communities where violence is pervasive and still have to figure out how to be in that space. And so being in that space could mean, you know, let me show people that I have a gun, that I have access to guns, or that I may affiliate with the gang, although I'm not really in the gang. That happens a lot. I mean, you see that with, with musicians. You see that with people in sports as well, uh, throwing up gang signs, wearing gang colors in order to kind of show that they're so connected to the community. That's still an important part of their identity and who they are. So it's hard to disentangle and tease out who's actually in the gang and who's not. But we, but you can see some clues, you know, in terms of looking at their communication over time. So people that are in gangs probably are talking to gang people frequently. So you can kind of see, okay, are they talking to a group of people who are from the same neighborhood? Are they talking to a group of people who are from the same block? Um, that can give you some clues as to who they're connected to. But if they're talking to an array of people, then I think there's more room for some discussion there. Well, you mentioned something that's really amazing when you're talking about the celebrities and how they're promoting gang culture, especially on Instagram. I mean, you can I think the Kardashians are, are one of the prime examples. I think it may have been Courtney that was sitting on top of a car and, and she was flashing uh, blood signs and things of that <laughs> nature. Uh, and, and, it, and it mimicked like a lot of kids like doing the same type of behavior that had no affiliation with gangs. Sure. And you see with the hip hop rappers as well that have no affiliation with gangs. But it's like they're uh, sending these signals, I guess, in order to boost record sales to kind of like, you know, have this hyper masculinity uh, in order to sell records. And you see kids who are not really gang affiliated, kind of being somewhat recruited, you know, by these big celebrities who are kind of doing it just for publicity sure. in order to make money. Sure. Yeah, I think co-opting is real. <laughs> I think co-opting is real. And I think it's used for uh, for capital gain. And I think that this is one of the things we're seeing on social media. Yeah. And another thing you allude to is kind of like the OGs. One of the things I'm wondering with internet banging, because it's so public, it's so out there. Is there an issue with some of the criminal activities that use, you know, typical gangs get involved in? You know, a lot of stuff, like you said, was silent in the past, but now you have the younger generations actually putting everything in social media. Um, I wonder if that's causing actual problems with some of the more entrenched gangs. Yeah, this is a big problem, actually. So the police have been monitoring social media for some time now. They've actually been ahead of the curve in terms of knowing the extent to which social media can be problematic for youth in urban settings. The police have been identifying um, a lot of criminal activity um, that's transpiring on social media, in particular um, selling drugs planning fights, planning uh, killings or murders, that kind of thing. Here in um, New York City, about a year ago, there was a huge bus, gang bust, and actually one of the um, project housing sites just um, north of Columbia University, where a uh, it was a, one of the largest gang bust in history, where young people were um, identified because of their social media activity and their communications around drugs and 
drug distribution. So again, what individuals are saying is reaches a large audience. And a, and a part of the problem is how they conceptualize privacy. When I talked to youth in Chicago, they had a kind of warped understanding of who can see their postings. So they think that, you know, if I have my settings set to private or if I'm only friends with this amount of people, these people are the only ones that are receiving my information. And that's just not true. It's particularly problematic when people are upset with one another. And so you may make a post and I don't like you anymore. And I'll copy and paste your post and I'll post it on someone else's um, page that can be in a rival gang. Um, and then they can see it and they'll send it out. So these things are flowing through social network traffic, but youth and young adults aren't always aware of how quickly their postings can move through social media space. Now, you know, along those same lines, what have you seen in regards to parents? Because since this profile is kind of taking place on social media, are parents aware that what their kids are putting up could really lead to the police knocking on your door and asking a bunch of questions? That's interesting. So in my study in Chicago, I asked youth about um, whether or not their parents knew they're on social media. And most parents knew. I, I think, again, it, it depends on your parenting style, how involved you are in your children's life. So I think parents knew. I think the extent to which they knew the, their children were involved in criminal behavior or gang activity was not as prominent. One example is a young gang member in Chicago who was recently killed. Her name was Ja'Kyra Barnes. And she um, had a lot of attention in various news outlets because she was a female gang member who had 20 body counts um, and up to 20 allegedly. And her mom had no idea that she was portraying herself online as a gang member and as a shooter. um, She would call herself a shooter. Others would call her a shooter. Her mom had no idea. Her mom only knew of her as being a protector, as being a quiet, timid person. She had no idea that, that her daughter had created or curated this identity online. And so, again, I think that it, it, it's going to vary um, depending on your parenting style. Yeah, I think that's a deeper level of parenting. Like you said, most of the parents understand that their child has some type of social media account. But that second level is what are you actually um, doing to monitor that social media account and what and how deep involved is your child on those accounts to sure. figure out, you know, if there's any criminal behavior that's taking place. Um, since you brought up Chicago, I know in the hip hop scene, there's been a lot of talk about how certain uh, rappers have influenced uh, gang behavior. So in, in, in your research and talking with a lot of those kids uh, in your studies, is hip hop being very important as kind of like a driver to a lot of the uh, internet banging? Uh, that's an interesting question. In my research, I wouldn't say that hip hop is a driver. I would say that hip hop is a part of the culture. And I think that anything that is a part of the culture in terms of how people talk, how they walk, how they move through space and time, I think all of those things end up on social media. So one of the things that is prominent is the use of rap lyrics um, that have many, many meanings. So you may see someone post a rap lyric that seems pretty aggressive, but, you know, that could be interpreted in multiple ways. So the youth could just be riding the bus, riding the train, they're listening to a song, they post it on Twitter, they're going about their day. Or the, again, this is where you conceptualize threats, right? So, or the post could be directed towards someone, and there needs to be kind of clear who that rap lyric is directed towards. And I think youth are kind of clear on how they're using rap lyrics, and so I think that that's an important um, important distinction uh, to be made. That's a great distinction because, you know, you, you hear a lot, you know, there's a lot of people in the media saying there's really the culture is influencing the behavior. But what I'm hearing from you is that that's not necessarily the case when you talk to the kids. They're looking for direct threats. They're looking for somebody to actually calling them out on social media in order for them to respond. Absolutely. I think that, you know, rap music is a part of their life and they use it in ways to kind of um, be emblematic of their experiences in their neighborhood. I think what's important is that aspects of the neighborhood can be tough. And those things are the things that we should be that we should care about and we should monitor and we should think very uh, deeply about. Now, in your research, have you seen um, like the use of emojis with this Internet banging? Do you see kids using different different emoji signs, different colors of emojis to kind of express their feelings? Absolutely. I think you've uh, you've read my paper that I just wrote. All these things are things that I just wrote about the past uh, few weeks. Yes. Wow. 
Um, youth can communicate an entire threat in an emoji. Um, they can. It's so interesting and actually quite savvy how they can communicate these things. And to the naked eye or the untrained eye, it, it seems very uh, harmless. And so, yes, uh, in my study in Chicago, you've talked about the ability to like use bombs and angry faces, and in particular handguns, um, the handgun emojis to communicate threats to other people. And you don't even have to use any words um, to express yourself. So th this is certainly a trend that youth are talking about. Oh, definitely. I think it's a new part of a hip hop culture as well. I think um, recently, I think it was hip hop artist Future that kind of got into some hot water where he posted a emoji of a handgun pointed at a basketball uh, in regards to some of the issues he was having with his uh, ex girlfriend sure. and, and Russell Wilson, the uh, quarterback from the Seahawks, sure. and, he, and then like a lot of other kids were, you know, reposting that gun emoji pointing at the football. So I think it's really like a hot part of communication now that a lot of the kids are using. So instead of me actually putting out certain things that can kind of get me in legal trouble, I'm going to kind of hide behind the emojis and send those out to yeah. get the same message. Yeah. Now, one of the things you talk about is uh, this term called spatial referencing on social media. Can you kind of explain that to the audience and, and, and give us some detail on spatial uh, referencing? Yeah. So in my work, I have always found it interesting that youth are posting their street addresses, their blocks, intersections to describe where they are. This uh, was actually came to mind in the um, issue with Little Jojo and Chief Keef. Um, he, Little Jojo, posted his street address on Twitter and said, I am at X location. If you want to come see me, come see me here. And that, that exact location is where Little Jojo was killed. I've seen many um, postings on Twitter where people are posting um, the house where they hang out. This could be, you know, a house where they sell drugs or a house where they congregate. And that um, the address for that house is used throughout their postings to represent kind of where they're from, who they are, you know. And so we're seeing a lot of that. And, and, and it is very um, common for youth in urban neighborhoods to be very clear about how they're navigating safe and unsafe locations. And so I think we're just seeing the same types of behaviors online as well. You know, I think that I think communication um, with parents and their kids is very key because what are you what are you really talking about is like privacy, yep. privacy settings. But when kids who are in the heat of emotions, and I think you know the key thing we have to understand about young people in particular, their brains haven't fully developed yet. So you know, when they're in an emotional state, they really don't care about privacy. If they're getting ready to get into an argument or a fight. It's very normal for them to post addresses, post their house in order to get something going, to pop sure. something off. Sure. Uh, even though as a parent, you may have said, hey, don't post any identifying information. If you're not having that on, uh, ongoing contact and really being in tune to what's going on with your child, it's very easy for them to get into some type of argument, some type of beef and post that information up sure. very quickly. Absolutely. So uh, one of the things um, I also saw in your research, you talked a lot about grief and depression. I think in particular to, you know, gang members and internet banging where a lot of these young people were really expressing grief uh, in their social media posts. Absolutely. And it was actually one of the most uh, surprising findings that I have come across in that youth are very communicative on social media, particularly youth who, who are in tough environments, youth that may not be as communicative one on one. And they're sharing things about, you know, their loved ones, how they feel, the pain that comes from a sudden death. And so I've written a number of papers about this young woman, uh, Jakara Barnes in Chicago. And I looked at, I started to follow her Twitter feed following the death of one of her close friends that was allegedly killed by Chicago police. And she took to Twitter and said things like, you know, the pain is unbearable. I, I can't take this anymore. You know, I can't sleep at night. Like things like that, that are indications of kind of where she is psychologically that I thought were helpful. And then two weeks later, she is killed by... Um, allegedly by rival gangs. And what I think is really important is what if an adult was connected to her on social media and could 
see these deeply personal and thoughtful posts about her mental state? What if someone was able to reach out to her as she was expressing herself over and over again and calling out for help through her social media posts? You know what? That's that's a great point because I think what you're alluding to is that there's very fertile ground, uh, especially in the social work field and the counseling field to kind of reach out to young people on social media that may be dealing with uh, depression and maybe grieving. Have you seen any research on that so far? Have you seen like there being a shift? Uh, like in the social work field where people are actually paying more attention uh, to social media for one and two, maybe actually looking for clientele in those avenues um, in order to help young people. I've seen more researchers using social media as a tool for reaching out to as a recruitment tool and as a tool to reach out to deliver services. However, using social media as, as the data point meaning what content is available to be analyzed and interpreted, not so much. And so I think that there is a gap in our use of social media and social work research, and I'm hoping to help fill that gap. But I think one of the challenges that we have in social work is trust, right? So does interacting with someone on social media break down trust with our clients? And so that's something that we need to think very critically about the extent to which um, engaging social media is problematic for building trust and building relationships um, with vulnerable populations. Definitely. So one last question for you when it comes to uh, parenting. If a parent is seeing their child being involved uh, in this internet banging or maybe there's some type of fake gangster, what would be you know, a suggestion for them of how to you know, address that situation? Yeah, I think it's so important for parents to be involved in what their kids are doing online. Not necessarily to be hovering, but to be asking questions. I think some important questions are, you know, well, how do you want to present yourself online? What do you, you know, what are you looking at nowadays online? What are you seeing online? Have you seen this post? You know, asking very detailed questions about how they're kind of engaging this space, not necessarily needing to to know their everyday interactions, but I think being involved in kind of what networks are they connected to online is, is really important. I think parents should ask questions about social media engagement to, to at least be in the know of what they're seeing, who they may be talking to, things like that. I think I think a major challenge is that, you know, social media is, is something that you can do on their phone. You know, they're, they're on their way to school, they're on the train, they're on the bus, they're with their friends, and they can hop online at any moment, at any time of the day. And parents see particularly parents of adolescents may not always be around and you want to develop trust with your kids. But I think having open and honest conversations about some of the challenges with social media, some of the things that you may be scared about as a parent on social media and communicating that to your child could be a helpful way to engage in a initial conversation. That's a great point. Dr. Pan, we really appreciate you being on our show today. And is there anywhere we can follow you on social media? We know that you're doing all this groundbreaking research. What's the best way for, for fans to get in contact and really follow your groundbreaking work? That you're Absolutely. Doing? Absolutely. You can follow me at, at SafeLab on Twitter and I also have a page on Facebook as well. Can you briefly explain SafeLab and what SafeLab is? Yeah, so SafeLab um, stands for Supporting Aggression-Free Environments for Urban Youth. Um, and we are essentially a, a space where we do research and, and community activities to support uh, reducing violence in urban neighborhoods. And so this um, includes doing evaluation work with violence prevention organizations, studying violence that happens in communities, and, and studying violence that happens online. And so we're a group of, of, uh, of researchers, some, some data scientists, some PhD and MSW students doing work uh, to help support the community. And what's the link to uh, Safe Lab if people want to go online and kind of look at some of the work that's already been done? Sure. If you Google Safe Lab, my website will pop up. Okay, great. We would definitely do that. And we also will put the link in our show notes. Thank you so much, Dr. Patton, for being Thank on the show you. today. Take care.